whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, earth. or a phantom of night that hath no heart, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul. Whatever thou be, until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hey, Dan. I'm Lindsay. Hello, Lindsay. Hello, sir. And uh, and Lindsay just has a book announcement, and then we're off to the races. Yes. Okay, so last week we said stay tuned for book news. Mm-hmm. And so here we are. Did you stay tuned? <laughs> um, okay. Just a reminder that this year we are doing a limited number of books. We're just doing 1,500 books, but all of them will be autographed. And then once those are gone... They be gone. Um, Now, please listen closely because we are going to share the on-sale announcements, uh, the dates here. So, 500 books will go on sale just for Annabelle's on August 9th. That's Friday, August 9th at 12 noon Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern time. And then on Tuesday, August 13th, our anniversary, (laughs) uh, the remaining 1,000 books will go on sale for anyone who wants to get one at 12 noon Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern time. And we'll put this in the episode description. You're going to see it on social media. So if you were driving like, I didn't catch it, don't worry. We'll be talking about it. All of the books are going to be pre-sale. And then they'll be shipped out as soon as we get them. And we estimate that we should have the books in our uh, distribution centers by the first-ish week of October, and you'll have them before or on Halloween. So with this timeline, we are almost certain we can guarantee that you'll have your books by Halloween. We've never not been able to deliver that, so I don't see why now, but I always get nervous saying like, we're going to do that, and then it not (laughs) happening. Um, And then just a reminder that you can do all of that at badmagicproductions.com when the time comes. And this year, Logan and I decided the fifth year fifth book. So mm-hmm. crazy. Mm-hmm. Uh, to do some extra fun stuff. So there will be like the usual stuff, you know, oh, stickers or what have you. But this year, we're going to do coffee. This one has Dan's face That's on cool. it. There'll be one with Dan's face. There'll be one with my face. Um, so you'll be able to get these when the books go on sale. You'll be able to get, uh, we're going to do a coffee mug. You'll, look how fun these are. This is like a, um, it's a, can you hear this? It's like a, it's not, it's not a soft koozie. It's a hard koozie. I don't know mm-hmm. what you call it. A hard sided. No idea. Cup holder thing. Um, and then the most exciting, I think, is just, are you guys ready to see the cover of the book? Because this is it. Here it is. Look at that. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Logan did an exceptional job. So this will be available, this design on the coffee, on the cup holder, on the coffee mugs on the blanket that I'm going to use today, a variety of other things in the store. So, and just as always, we remain ever grateful for your support. Yeah. Thank you. And and again, uh, those details will be in the episode description. So, uh, like Lindsay said, if you missed that stuff, just check, check, uh, check your phone, check your device. I said it as fast as I could. I know. Good job. Good job. I didn't, I didn't want to add because I didn't want to like stretch it out. So that's why I was just listening. (laughs) Good job. Uh, so how many fan submitted stories do you have for us on this sunny summer's day? Oh, is it sunny? (laughs) It's off and on. Yeah, it's something out there. Uh, I have three stories this week. My first story is a good old-fashioned Ouija board story. Okay. I feel like I haven't had one of those in quite some time. Yeah, we haven't. Yeah, so that one will be fun. And then my second tale, uh, loving this one, very spooky about what you might bring home with you when you visit the cemetery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then my third, a Cambodian folklore tale. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you got a little interesting uh, bit of variety with that one. A little bit of this and a little bit of that. I have my standard two this week. Uh, no, you don't say. My first story revolves around a real creepy man who might be hanging around uh, as an even creepier ghost. Mm. Don't want to give uh, away more than that. And then my second revolves around the mysterious disappearance of the Jameson family in Oklahoma in 2009. Did the paranormal activity they claimed was tormenting them prior to their disappearance somehow lead to their disappearance? So once you're all cozied up, got your socks on, I'll... Uh, Get right into my first tale. There's no real setup. I have really funny socks on this week. They say, for those of you that cannot read that tininess, it says, I never fart. This must be in relation to a bonus episode where we talked about never farting in front of one another. Funny. 
12 years in, you guys, we're going strong. <laughs> okay, so like I said, no, no real setup for this first allegedly true tale. We're going to get right into the uh, following paranormal encounter claim of a young woman who identifies herself only as Joanna or Joey. Time now for the tale of he put his hands on me. Joanna walked into the kitchen hiding behind her mom. She was nine, desperately shy, and terrified. It was her first sleepover at someone else's house, and even though she was excited to play with her friend Kimberly and some other girls from her third grade class, all Joanna could think about was how uncomfortable she was. Even though it was the fall, the air conditioning was blaring in Kimberly's house, and the hardwood floor was cold on Joanna's bare feet. The kitchen smelled overwhelmingly sweet, like flowers and baked goods, which normally Joanna would have liked. But in that moment, she yearned for the smoky, comforting, spice-filled aroma of her own kitchen, where her dad was always cooking something delicious. Kimberly's mom knelt down so she was eye-level with little Joanna. Her perfume smelled like petunias, and Joanna slightly wrinkled her nose. Joey, the woman said, Kimberly is so happy you could come to a birthday party. She and the other girls are downstairs playing dress-up. Would you like to join them? Joanna shook her head and tucked herself farther uh, behind her mom's legs. Come now, Joanna, her mom said. You're going to have such a lovely time. And I'm, and I'm just one phone call away if you need me. Joanna nodded, gave her mom one last hug, and tentatively made her way into the basement. A few hours later, Kimberly, Joanna, and the three other girls were all tucked into their sleeping bags, sprawled across the basement floor. They were all giggling, even Joanna, at Kimberly's impression of their cranky gym teacher. Much to little Joanna's surprise, she felt semi-comfortable. Kimberly's mom had given everybody nice foam pads to put under their sleeping bags, and Kimberly had even let Joanna borrow one of her favorite teddy bears to snuggle with. Eventually, the giggles died out, and the talking faded, and everyone was asleep. But a few hours later, Joanna woke up with a bellyache. She was starving. The pizza they had had for dinner had been adorned with pineapples, which Joanna despised. So since her arrival, she had only really eaten cake. Joanna remembered that Kimberly's mom had left a bowl of Fig Newtons and Cliff Bars on the kitchen table for the girls to nibble on if they got hungry. Feeling brave and exceptionally hungry, Joanna grabbed the teddy bear she was snuggling with, snuck out of her sleeping bag, and crawled up the short staircase into the kitchen. All the lights had thankfully been left on. She spotted the orange bowl of snacks sitting on the kitchen table and delicately padded her way across the freezing tile floor. It felt like ice under her feet. So she hopped from one foot to the other while rummaging through the snacks. Finally, she picked out a chocolate cliff bar. But try as she might, she could not get it open. She tried gnawing at it with her teeth, pulling it apart at the seams, but to no avail. Need help with that little one? A gruff voice said from behind her. Joanna spun around. She would have screamed had she not been so paralyzed with shock. It was a man, a tall man. He was wearing a blue plaid button-down shirt, His hair was thinning and he had a mustache. He was rubbing his hands together and an eager, sly little smile crept across his face. Joanna didn't like the way he was looking at her. Joanna tried to remember her manners. I'm, uh, I'm sorry, I, I... Tsk, tsk, tsk. A pretty girl like you should never apologize for nothing, he cooed, sauntering over closer to her. Joanna instinctively backed up. She wanted to scream for help, but she knew the man must be one of Kimberly's relatives or a friend. How else would he have been able to get into the house? She didn't want to be rude, but she was so scared. He was so tall, she thought again, and so happy to see her. He was too happy to see her. Something about that made her really uncomfortable, and he kept coming closer. Joanna's back hit the china cabinet. The man knelt down in front of her. His face was so close to hers, she started to whimper. Now, now he said, gently grabbing her hand and bringing it to his lips for a little kiss. His mouth was cold like the kitchen tile. He then reached for her other hand, not knowing what exactly she was protesting, but knowing something was wrong, Joanna furiously shook her head. Still, she couldn't bring herself to say no, to tell him to go away. Looking back, she's not sure she even knew how. The man took the cliff bar Joanna had been gripping tightly in her hand. Need some help with this? He asked. Without taking his eyes off of Joanna, he ripped open the wrapper and offered the exposed bar back to her. She squeezed her eyes shut and stifled a sob. She felt his hand caress her cheek. It was so cold, like metal, like a knife. Her face went numb under the touch of his icy fingers. Oh, sweetness, he purred. Why don't you open your mouth and take a bite? I know you're hungry. Joanna felt the man slowly part her lips open with the cliff bar. 
She screamed and ran now. She ran faster than she ever had in her short life, with more fury and more terror than she should have ever known. She barreled down the stairs, sobbing. The other girls all woke up and huddled around her, asking what happened. All Joanna could do was point to the open door at the top of the staircase and gasp through uncontrollable cries. There's a man up there! There's a man up there! Kimberly started shrieking, Mommy! Mommy! Come quick! Mommy! Everything happened so fast. In an instant, Kimberly's mom was there, wrapping Joanna in a blanket and locking her and the girls in the basement guest bedroom, while Kimberly's dad ran wildly around the house with his gun, looking for the intruder. Soon after that, Joanna's own parents and the police were there, asking the little girl questions she didn't know how to answer. What did this man look like? Did you see where he entered the house? Did you see where he went? What did he say to you? Can you show me where he touched you? Can you tell the detective what you told me? For days and days, they searched for the man, but they never found him. While she was in middle school, Joanna finally learned that because the police never found any evidence of a break-in, they were confident that she had just made the whole thing up. Her parents, thank God, and Kimberly's family, too, they believed her. They always believed her. Kimberly and Joanna stayed best friends all throughout elementary school, middle school, high school, and now college. They were still inseparable, supporting each other and caring for each other through everything, no matter how hard. And the hardest thing they'd had to endure together thus far, the scariest thing, happened at their high school graduation party. They decided to throw a party together in Kimberly's large backyard. It was a lively affair, and the two girls were elated the entire day. At one point, Joanna and Kimberly were giggling in the kitchen at the poster collage their moms had made. It was an overwhelming composition of photos of the girls throughout their adolescence. Pictures of little Joanna sucking her thumb at three. Pictures of Kimberly performing terrible power ballads for her parents at five. Pictures of them playing dress-up together at all ages. Pictures of awkward homecoming dates, of various sporting events, of family reunions and birthdays. God, you were an ugly baby, teased Joanna, pointing at a photo of Kimberly as a wrinkly newborn. At least I didn't have braces until last year, retorted Kimberly, gesturing to a photo of Joanna at their junior prom, where she wore a bright blue dress that inadvertently matched the bright blue rubber bands on her braces. Fair point, she laughed while leaning against the kitchen table. Oh my God, she continued. My feet are killing me. Joanna yanked off her gold wedges and stood on her bare feet. The tile was freezing. Suddenly, she remembered that night, almost 10 years ago. She had been standing on that cold kitchen floor, trying to open the cliff bar when he walked in. Or maybe he was already there. The whole night was so fuzzy now. At times, she even doubted the reality of it all. Maybe she really did make the whole thing up. But then something caught her eye. In the middle of the collage was a picture of Kimberly at two or three years old, smiling big and standing by the pool, surrounded by a few other kids Joanna recognized as her cousins. And behind them in the background, there was a man, a tall man, exceptionally tall. He was a bit blurry. It looked like he just happened to walk past while the photo was being taken. Joanna ripped the photo off the collage and stared at it. Kimberly stared at her, confused. Joanna, what are you? Who is this? Joanna interrupted, practically shoving the picture in her friend's face. Who is that? Who? Joanna felt tears welling up in her eyes. She was furious. No, she was scared. It couldn't possibly be him, but she knew it was. Kimberly gently took the photo from Joanna's hands that were starting to shake. She stared intently at it and looked back up at Joanna, even more confused than before. That's my uncle, she said slowly. Um, well, sort of my uncle. He's my dad's stepbrother. I only met him once. It was on this trip, actually. He was creepy. Sort of estranged from the... Joanna's wild and desperate eyes prompted no, begged Kimberly to continue. Um, he was, well, I guess he was a pedophile. Never any convictions. I don't think, but he did enough creepy stuff for my dad to never want to see him again. I don't know, he doesn't really talk about him. Joanna struggled to find the words. But but where where is he now? Does he live around here? W where does he live? Kimberly, please. In that moment, Kimberly realized what Joanna was really asking her. She set the photo down and placed her hands lovingly on her best friend's shoulders. Oh, Joey, that night? She began. It couldn't have been him. No, but but why? Why why not? Joanna cried, grabbing the photo and aggressively pointing at the blurry figure in the background. Kimberly, I know that's him. That's the man who was in here with me that night. That's the man who said all that creepy things. That's the man that started to touch me. She trailed off. It can't be him, Joey, Kimberly said softly. He's dead. I mean, he was dead then too. He died when I was three. We didn't go to the funeral or anything, but he definitely died. He'd have been dead seven years by then. Joanna grasped behind herself for a chair and nearly fell into it. It was him. She knew it was. 
She squeezed her eyes shut and began to cry. She cried for her nine-year-old self and the horror of it all. She cried for the truth about that night that she would never find and the closure she would never get. How had he been there? How had he touched her? She heard Kimberly comforting her, but she felt too far away, too alone, too isolated. Her friend's words drowned into nothingness. All Joanna could hear was the muffled sound of her own ragged breath, and all she could feel was the bare, her bare feet on the cold tile. Then it seemed as if Kimberly disappeared altogether, as did everyone else in the house, and the world grew impossibly quiet for a moment before she felt frozen fingers caress her cheek. Simultaneously, a low voice purred, Shh, shh, you're all right, little pretty one. Joanna screamed and opened her eyes. And just for the briefest moment, she saw the man from the photo, the man from the sleepover, bent over with his face so near to hers. And then he was gone. All of a sudden, Joanna felt like she was nine years old again, once more sending everyone in Kimberly's house into a panic over some scary man that only she saw touching her in the kitchen. A man she now knew was dead. That was two years ago. And while Joanna and Kimberly are still close, they're no longer inseparable. Joanna no longer feels comfortable in Kimberly's parents' house for obvious reasons. And Kimberly no longer feels entirely comfortable around Joanna. Seeing Joanna now makes her think too often one of two things. That her best friend sometimes sees things that aren't there and won't admit that she isn't mentally well. Or that the ghost of her pedophile uncle can seemingly show up at any time in her childhood home and he can still touch you. Ugh. Yeah. I wondered where that was going because it felt mm -hmm, creepy, like just violating. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, well, it's a ghost. Maybe it's just a creepy ghost. Oh, it is a creepy ghost. Well, yeah. yeah I just yeah, didn't but I know, know he was going to have that kind of. That backstory. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, no pictures came with it, but, uh, but Molly Box, who found this uh, story, she, she created uh, a few with some AI or create a few AI photos of what she thought this guy would look like. Okay. So pretty good job. Uh, so the, here's this first one that I found particularly creepy. Oh, nice. Just, mm -hmm. Wow. Just a shadowy dude in the kitchen. And then this next one. So tall. Uh-huh. I thought it was a little more creepy. Mm, I think the first one's more creepy. I just don't like this guy's posture. Oh, okay. Just like too stiff. Arms oh. too straight down. Or very unnatural. Okay. Uh, and, then I, and then I Googled creepy pedophile in the kitchen. And I just thought this was hilarious. A picture of Danny DeVito from Always Sunny in Philadelphia what? came up. That was like the second image that came up. It makes no sense. I don't even think they're talking about anything related to pedophiles. It's just a random scene. And I just love, because he's a really tall ghost. Yeah. I love that Danny DeVito, like one of the shortest working actors ever. How tall is Danny DeVito? I don't know, but I think he's around five foot flat or maybe okay. like between 4'10 and 5'2, somewhere in there. It's impossible to tell how tall any actor is because the scale of things uh -huh. when you're, yeah, it's just... Yeah. He's 4'10". He Thank is 4'10". Four four okay, ten. on the low end of that scale. Wow, yeah. Yeah, so uh, so there's he that was, story. He's he's aged quite well. He, You know, he has actually, it's kind of crazy where it, it feels like for like 30 or 30 plus years, like there was that movie, what, Twins with mm -hmm. Arnold Schwarzenegger? And then when I see clips of him in Always Sunny, I'm like, how does he look exactly the same? Oh man, we got to get on that regimen. And he, he's one of those guys like where he went bald like young yeah but like kept the fringe of hair around his head and that has stayed like perfect <laughs> for like decades yeah yeah it's fascinating hilarious Ooh, that was so yeah, was bothersome a, yeah th that was an unsettling story i got uh -huh. like creeped out again just like retelling it mm -hmm. yeah uh you ready to move away from a creepy uncle ghost and explore a mysterious disappearance sure okay tiny bit of setup on this one before i really get going uh, we've covered plenty of mysterious disappearances here on Scared to Death, uh, a few just recently. While many of these disappearances are plenty eerie on their own, like the recent possibility that the entire town of Dublin, Wisconsin, not only disappeared, but was somehow wiped from the historical record, the disappearance of several members of or of an entire family, like the five missing solder children we covered early on, might be the most frightening. Mysteriously losing a single loved one would be devastating. Losing five? easily enough to drive someone mad. And mysteriously losing an entire family, how hard would that be for any grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins to understand and process? It's actually sadly somewhat easy to wrap one's head around how an individual could disappear. Maybe they met a bad end somehow and no one was there to see exactly where they got lost in the woods or who picked them up when they were last seen hitchhiking. Maybe they were having money problems and decided to start a new life off the grid. Maybe they hit their head, forgot who they were, and are lost out in the world that has become suddenly confusing and confounding to them. 
But none of that can explain the disappearance of an entire family, can it? More people means more chances that someone would eventually call a friend or a relative or be spotted somewhere or at least leave some kind of clue. And there's the matter of how many people are connected to families, friends, neighbors, their own extended relatives. So how would no one know anything about a group of people? All of these questions would come up when the Jameson family disappeared in October of 2009. Time now for the tale of the mysterious Jameson family disappearance. On October 8th, 2009, Bobby Jameson, 44 years old, his wife Sherilyn, 40, their daughter, 6-year-old Madison, and their dog Maisie, loaded up into their pickup truck and headed into Oklahoma's San Bois Mountains. And then they were never heard from again. The Jamesons had lived in the town of Eufaula, Oklahoma for years, and life for them there had not been without its struggles. A car accident in 2003 involving Bobby had left him with chronic back pain, left him unable to work as he had before. Sherilyn suffered from bipolar disorder, and while she was medicated, she still often experienced bouts of severe depression. And it seems the family dealt with trouble of the supernatural variety as well. In the months leading up to their disappearances, Bobby and Sherilyn spoke to their pastor numerous times about their belief that their home had been invaded by dark spirits. Spirits that worried them to the point that they felt that an exorcism would be needed to get rid of them. Their daughter, Madison, had started talking to a so-called imaginary friend named Emily, and her parents began to believe that Emily was actually a malevolent entity. And it wasn't just members of the Jameson family who worried that something supernatural was going on. An unnamed friend of Sherilyn's would tell the police that she sometimes held seances with Sherilyn, trying to contact the spirits in the Jameson home, and that they did contact something. Numerous friends and family members agreed with the Jamesons that their home was haunted, and a few went on to share, following their disappearance, what they experienced inside the house. Nikki Shenhold, Sherilyn's best friend, would tell journalists the house was haunted. I don't want to sound crazy, but whenever I went there, I felt a horrible presence. I would leave feeling so down and depressed. Doors would open and close on their own. Phantom footsteps would be heard walking throughout the house. A child-sized apparition was sometimes seen at the top of the stairs. Other apparitions were supposedly witnessed all around the house. At one point, Bobby told his pastor he'd seen a handful of dark spirits on the roof of the family's home. Spirits he felt uh, he frequently heard either moving around on the roof or in the attic. Shortly before the family disappeared, Bobby was planning on trying to exorcise these spirits in the home himself. After they vanished, religious objects, both Christian and Satanic, such as a copy of the Satanic Bible, were supposedly found in the home. And right before they disappeared, the family's cat suddenly died, having likely been poisoned. No one would ever figure out who did it. In July of 2009, three months before the Jamesons vanished, Sherilyn's ex-husband took custody of their son, Colton. During the custody hearing, 12-year-old Colton said he would prefer to live with his dad, and he gave a statement about his mother claiming she seemed very depressed and that she often acted strangely. At the time, people thought this was due, of course, to her bipolar disorder, but later many would wonder, if it was actually something else, something supernatural that was bringing her down. The day they disappeared, October 9th, it seemed like something good was on the horizon. Bobby and Sherilyn were thinking of buying a 40-acre plot of land in the San Bois Mountains near a little town about an hour from where they lived called Red Oak. They were trying to get the fuck out of their haunted home. The plan, if the sale went through, was to first live in a storage shed that they already owned on the land and then build a new home. But this plan would, of course, never come to fruition. On October 9th, Bobby and Sherilyn visited an associate of the landowner, and when the meeting was done, the family parked the truck and went for a short walk for around 15 minutes, taking their GPS unit and finding a quiet spot on the hillside to take in the amazing views. After they returned to their vehicle, they drove a little further and then, with the truck left parked and locked on a rarely used dirt road, they vanished and would never be seen alive again. Eight days later, on Saturday, October 17th, some hunters on dirt bikes ran across the Jameson's abandoned truck in Latimer County, a bit northwest of Red Oak, and called police to report the vehicle. Initially, the police assumed the vehicle was stolen before realizing it had instead been abandoned. Latimer County Sheriff Israel Beauchamp took charge, launching a huge search operation and and combing the area with over 400 volunteers. Horses, mules, ATVs, 16 different teams of cadaver dogs, and an unmanned drone. And all of that effort led to nothing. During the searches, the cadaver dog teams did repeatedly find the family's scent around a nearby water tower, which was promptly drained to make sure they hadn't somehow gotten inside and drowned. 
no further evidence in, on, or near the water tower would be found. Making the disappearance of the family even more puzzling, when police searched the truck, they found Bobby and Sherilyn's cell phones inside, $32,000 in cash, some maps, a GPS device, Sherilyn's purse, and Bobby's wallet. Why would they leave everything in the truck like that? And where had they gotten all that cash? The family had been living mostly on Bobby's disability checks for years. When police examined Bobby's phone from the truck, they found that the final photo on it had been taken nearby on the mountain. It was a pic of his six-year-old daughter, Madison, the girl who spoke to her imaginary friend, or very real and dangerous entity. Numerous friends and family will later say that they believe this photo was not taken by Madison's parents. One friend would say, In the picture, Madison is looking away from the camera. She looks unhappy and has her arms crossed. If that had been Bobby or Sherilyn behind the camera, she would have never looked like that. So who took it? Adding another layer of confusion to the search, the family's thirsty and malnourished dog, Maisie, was found by rescuers. Also, the vehicle was in full working order, had plenty of fuel. Investigators also found an 11-page so-called hate letter written by Sherilyn to Bobby in the truck. She accused him of not caring about his daughter, and she listed all the things she hated about Bobby, including that he was a loner and a hermit, and she wanted a divorce. Why would she write this letter if she was also trying to buy land with Bobby? Evidence of some sort of bipolar episode? Or was Sherilyn struggling with something else? the same thing she wanted to have exercised. There were no signs of a struggle, either in the vehicle or on the soft ground around the truck. There was no blood, no broken glass, nothing. And then as the search continues, more evidence is found that possibly points to, again, something paranormal. Investigators comb through surveillance footage taken from outside the Jameson's home, and in the video, Bobby and Sherilyn can be seen walking back and forth about 20 times between their house and the truck strangely loading items in what looks to some like they're in a zombie-ish trance. Sometimes when they take a trip to the truck, they aren't even carrying anything. Other times, they'll stop and just stand there, stare off into the distance with a vacant look on their faces. Adding to the strangeness, when police check the records of the cell phone found in the truck, they find it had made a single outgoing call to a voicemail after those hunters found the truck, when it would have been locked inside the abandoned vehicle. After months of searching, with still no clue what happened to the family, with absolutely nothing to go on, the Latimer County Sheriff's Office will call off the search, and this case will now go cold for four years until a subsequent discovery brings more questions than answers. On November 16, 2013, just under three miles from where the truck was found, some deer hunters stumbled upon the skeletal remains of two adults and one child. The remains were found in the Smokestack Hollow area of Panola Mountain, an extremely remote area. The evidence was beyond decomposed, Three skulls, a number of bones and bone fragments, some shoes and a few scraps of clothing. Forensic testing confirmed eight months later that the remains were indeed those of Bobby, Sherilyn, and young Madison Jameson. When questioned as to why the initial searches had found absolutely nothing, despite their enormous size and scope, the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation told reporters that, quote, falling leaves potentially obscured the bodies. Some would find this logic incredibly questionable. Due to the extensive decomposition that had occurred in the four years since the disappearances, it was deemed impossible to determine a conclusive cause of death, although one of the skulls, that of Bobby, had a small hole that was initially suspected of being a bullet wound, but later the police would say that it was not a bullet wound, just the result of decomposition. So what the hell happened to the Jameson family? Why were they walking around in the woods far from their vehicle where they had left everything? Why did they leave their wallet and purse, all that cash in the truck? Why couldn't all of those search dogs find their scent or find their dog, uh, I guess, quickly? Did the paranormal problems that the Jameson family were having at home follow them into the woods? Did something lead them into the woods? Who took that final photo of Madison? So many questions. Police first theorized the Jamesons had simply gotten lost and died of hypothermia. But the trouble with this theory is that the bodies were found neatly lined up side by side with their faces down. It looked like they had been killed execution style. Were they executed? If so, why didn't their killer get uh, go get all that money? They were also found three miles from their truck and given Bobby's back problems, it was highly unlikely he would have wanted to go walking off into the hills. Also, the Jameson's truck was parked in such a way that it appeared that they were leaving and were stopped by somebody. But who? Or was it a murder-suicide? Sherilyn was known to supposedly carry a 22 caliber pistol with her in the truck, and the coroner found a small hole in Bobby's skull that initially they thought might have been from a bullet, but neither Sherilyn nor Madison's remains showed any evidence of a possible gunshot wound. And the gun, if Sherilyn was even carrying it with her that day, has never been found. Finally, there is one more theory about the family's disappearance, the wildest one. 
were the Jamesons members of some satanic cult. Sherilyn's mother, Connie, would claim that her daughter and son-in-law were dabbling in the occult. Did they summon something that ended up destroying them? That is actually what the Jamesons' family pastor, Gary Brandon, seems to think. Gary told police during the initial investigation that the family had been involved in spiritual warfare and that both Bobby and Sherilyn had told him they were seeing dark spirits in the house. And a satanic Bible and so-called witch's Bible were both found in their home shortly after their disappearances. Strange messages were found written in their home as well. One read, three cats killed to date by people in this area. Witches don't like black cats being killed. And that's all the clues we have. So what really happened to the Jameson family? We'll probably never know. But a lot of details surrounding their disappearance seem to point to something much stranger than a case of hypothermia. That is really, really strange. And I feel so bad she has a remaining son. Uh-huh. Who's with, I mean, with his bio dad, but man. Uh-huh. Yikes. Like a weird survivor's guilt, kind mm-hmm. of, I'm mm-hmm. sure. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just the the money being in the truck. So much money. So much money. Mm-hmm. That's really I know, that's peculiar. what's really, really weird to me, because if this was like an execution, yeah, then why... Yeah, why would you leave all of that stuff in the vehicle? Yeah, why wouldn't you just take the vehicle? Right, and three miles away, and I even just like kind of wondered too, like, okay, let's say Sherilyn did have that gun which she carried with her, mm-hmm. and she is mentally ill. She's not thinking clearly. She's having some kind of a bipolar, you know, like episode. Mm-hmm. Um, if they left everything in the truck, it's weird for them to, like, uh, to me, cell phones included. Like, who leaves, uh, you know, like in modern times? No one. Their cell Because if something happens, you want to be able to call for help. That's right. So, like, that's really weird. So, that would tell me that if she were to say, like, okay, she gets paranoid, she kills them. Yeah. But then she she marches, that she makes them leave everything in the car, and then walks them three miles away, and then kills them. That just seems highly unlikely to me. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and, and, and why, or if she was going to, like, I don't know. I mean, I guess, you know, when you're truly in a kind of, like, manic episode, and you are truly irrational, things don't have to make sense. Right. But that seems especially crazy and then along those three miles that neither her daughter nor her husband would like try to fight back, act something. That's how I was thinking the daughter would like try and run away. Or, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I had so many crazy thoughts of like, all right, let's see. If a drug cartel did this, they would be inclined to leave the money because it would be a thing of like, you know, we don't want anyone to know who did this. But, it's but like, would they? I think they would take the money. Not, not, Especially because nobody knew, knew they had the money. I don't know. I just was like trying to think about like under what scenario yeah would you leave the money and it would be like well you'd leave the money if you didn't want to get caught for the murders i don't know why i went to drug cartel i, yeah. I doubt that's happening in the middle of oklahoma but i mean okay. it could happen anywhere who knows okay, yeah. true true and then okay they were looking at buying that land mm-hmm. and i'm sure that the landowner was raked over the coals questioned right right i'm sure so too it's like because they had it said you said the story that you shared said that they met with the landowner yeah, they met with an associate of the landowner. Okay, so it's like, where's that person? But then I would think, okay, because I, I was thinking about that if too. if you murdered them, then you'd leave the money. Well, no, actually what I would think is if you murdered these people and then left the bodies, excuse me, they didn't take the bodies off site, off of the land. Right. Or, or not very far. They're three miles away. So I don't, I don't, it doesn't make any sense to me that somebody would kill this, these three people mm-hmm. and, uh, and just leave their bodies out in the woods, but then also leave their vehicle with all of their identifying information, their driver's licenses, all of that stuff like nearby. It's if you're, if you're going to go to the trouble in this remote area to kill these people, wouldn't you also hide the vehicle, burn it? Not necessarily. Cause I think it's like a good sort of like major look like Mm. Because, okay, because if the money's missing, then they're going to be looking for somebody who's recently spent a lot of money, somebody who's made a large deposit, somebody like there's, it's traceable. Not, not that the murder can't be, but then why kill him? I I, I have no idea the motivation whatsoever, whatsoever. Who knows? I mean, you don't know the mental state of the person that was the associate of the landowner and maybe there was some sort of quarrel, some sort of beef. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I know if, if there was, if there was no paranormal ex- or if there is no paranormal explanation for this, something really secretive and weird went on. Well, and that's where that satanic cult stuff comes in. I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Something that yeah. they were living some kind of, they, they knew somebody, some, one of them did, one of them may, maybe upset somebody, something weird happened that the rest of the family doesn't seem to know about. 
But then, okay. Or they just happen to come across a psychopath out in the woods. It's totally plausible. Who just marched them out there further and then killed them and then left their bodies. And then somebody not motivated by money. Right. So some opportunity. I mean, there are those opportunistic killers. Mm -hmm. But I mean, weird in that area? Just, I don't know. Yeah, it's I don't very know. strange. Let me tell you. I, like, I get leaving the truck, the cell phone, the money. Huh. Because yeah. that's, I don't know. That just, that's more things to touch. Yeah. It's more ways that you could get caught, like simplify. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if it was just some true like psychopath. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hate to say this, but like sexually motivated killer. I mean, it, it could have been somebody who spotted the wife. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's gross, but it could yeah. be somebody who spotted the daughter. I know. And then the other people just get killed because they're with that person. Yeah. But then but, they were all buried together. I know, but then why? Down. Yeah. But then why are they all together? And then there was, they never found the gun if the gun was there. And there was no sign of bullet wound entry into the brains, uh, into the skull. No. Not that you couldn't be shot and killed in other ways, but I'm just saying like uh, yeah. execution style would lead you to believe back of the skull, face, mm -hmm. you know, right. Kneeling, face down. Right? Yeah, yeah, they could have been like, uh, asphyxi I don't know. They could I have don't know. strangled, who knows? It is a very bothersome case. Let me tell yep. you, if I live in that area and this happens, I want to move. Yeah. I am I am scared. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is scary. I just have one photo. Okay. Uh, it's just a photo of the Jameson family. Not not oh. all together that long before. I mean, I guess a little while because she's pretty little little there, but Bobby, Sherilyn, and Madison. They're just like a cute little family. Uh-huh. Sweet babies. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man. Ugh. Well, you with the creepy stories this week. Huh? Mm-hmm. Ugh. Blech. Uh, last night when we went to bed, I yeah. had taken a gummy. And how how did you sleep last night? Did uh, good that gummy didn't mess you up? Uh, uh I was so paranoid last night. My mm. heart was a little racy. It happens every once in a while when I have my little sleepy time gummies. Yeah. Uh, and then I kept. I was like, oh, what's that? And I kept sitting up in bed, and I just kept seeing weird shadow oh, shapes. Weird. And I was like, lie down, you're fine. And then I would roll over and I'd look the other way, and I was like, oh no. And so I was. <laughs> fidgeting a lot last night. Yeah, it wasn't keeping me up. Oh, well, lucky for you. <laughs> I was up. And then Ginger was keeping me up. But I just thought that, I, I didn't know if it was me or if the energy in our room was off last night. No, it felt fine to me. Okay, well, it's probably just me. <laughs> All right. Uh, you got a Layla over there? I do. Oh, black Layla. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so just a reminder, this is a Ouija board tale. Okay. And the submitter entitled it, Grandma Was Never the Same. <laughs> Dear Dan and Lindsay, king and queen of the suckdom. I found your podcast through Time Suck and have been addicted to the scares. I get so excited every Tuesday knowing there's terror on the way. Thank you. Now, on to the insanity. I am a self-admitted Darren, and I want to tell you about one of the wildest things that has ever happened to me. Back in high school, and still today, I have a love for urban exploration. I would spend my time wandering through abandoned hospitals, sanitariums, tunnels, and the like. My great passion as a full-time creeper is to experience the paranormal. The unknown is one of life's greatest enigmas, and I seek to better understand it no matter how reckless or terrifying. I feel like this is someone you'd want to hang out with. <laughs> yeah. However, when I was 16, I think my reckless search for the paranormal caused something unintended to reach into this realm. My partner, Jason, told me he'd been seeing things for a while. As a kid, the hat man would appear in his doorway late at night, and recently, he'd encountered the spirit of a little girl. Since my love for horror and all things spooky knew no bounds, I convinced my partner to hold a Ouija session in his basement. We didn't have a traditional board, so I made one myself using a Sharpie and a large piece of art paper. With our janky board finished, we went down into his basement. At the time, the only other person who was in the house was Jason's small, feeble grandma who was upstairs listening to an audiobook on the couch. In the unfinished basement, we began the session. It was summer and the basement was relatively cool despite the concrete floors and walls. As we moved the, as we moved the handmade planchette around in an attempt to conjure a spirit, nothing too exciting happened. We idly watched the candle flicker in our peripheral as the planchette bobbed from one random letter to the next, making no sense. It wasn't until I felt the unmistakable feeling of being watched from the darkness that I really invested myself into the session. The sound of loud, heavy boots came clomping down the stairs. Jason and I were initially unfazed. We assumed it was his father returning home and coming down to scold us about being alone in the basement, which he often did, but nothing happened. The footsteps stopped at the bottom of the stairs, but no one came. We looked at each other confused. 
Suddenly, as if whatever had come down the stairs crept up behind me, I felt a massive cold spot in the same corner where I had felt the invisible gaze come from. The area was at least 10 degrees colder than the rest of the basement, and you could run your hand around it, feeling where the warmth ended and the cold began. Freaked out, we closed the session and went upstairs. We went into the living room and saw that his grandmother was still nestled on the couch. Grandma asked his, Jason asked his grandma if she had moved around at all, and she said she hadn't. So who came downstairs? That night, my partner did something even my horror junkie ass wouldn't do. He pricked his finger and spread his blood all over the board I had made and proceeded to do a session all by himself. But when nothing happened, he put the Ouija board back in the basement. The next morning, my partner told me something that chilled me to the bone. He said that he was playing video games around midnight when he saw his grandmother shuffle down from her room and go into the basement. Jason's grandma is old and fragile. She has the strength of a small bird, but he (laughs) swears he heard the sound of large pieces of furniture being moved around. The noise went on for a few minutes before his grandmother came back upstairs, said nothing, and went to bed. Jason went downstairs to investigate. Everything looked normal, but what he couldn't find was the Ouija board I had made. It was now missing. We wanted to brush it off, but something about the situation kept nagging at us. We wanted answers. The next day after school, Jason asked his grandma why she had gone downstairs and she flat out denied ever having gone ever having gone to the basement. She adamantly claimed that she came down, got a glass of water, and went straight back to bed. When she said that this when she said this, there was a tinge of anger in her voice which made me nervous. Normally she was a sweet, mild woman, but now there was something rough about the way she spoke. We didn't push it any further. We took her at her word and that was that. A few days later, something awful happened. My partner's grandma fell down a small flight of stairs and she needed medical attention. Shortly after his grandma left, Jason found the Ouija board carefully tucked under the bed where she slept. I never saw her again after that. That was six years ago and the memory is as fresh as ever. Did we release some monstrous entity? And did that entity attach itself to Jason's grandmother? Why was the bloody spirit board hidden away under her bed? And what really caused her to fall? There's too many unanswered questions for me to ever feel comfortable with what happened. Keep up the great scares. Love what you do. Never change. And then no name attached to that, right? Uh, no. They, they reference Jason as a partner, but never their own name? Uh, no, yeah. I, I don't think so. I, I, yeah. Some, you know, when we like reach out for um, submission, yeah. permission, uh, book permission, sometimes we don't hear back. So then we just kind of err on the side of caution. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, what what the the narrator there said at the end was basically like what I was kind of taking notes on. Mm-hmm. Just that concept of what if you're messing around in a house with a Ouija board or you know holding a seance or whatever, and you you do bring some spirit into this realm and it doesn't go after you. I mean, I know they heard the boots going down the steps. Yeah. But then just some random person in the house who has no idea what you're doing, it finds them and then could potentially possess them. I'd never really like thought about that. How pissed would you be if Monroe and her girlfriends held a seance in the basement and then things in our house grew really uncomfortable? I'd be pretty pissed. I'd be pretty pissed. Or it's like like once you came out of it, even more pissed. How would how pissed would you be if you find out later like that there was a seance or you know, Ouija board session w- was held? And then that explains why you felt like an entity was like inside, like you felt different. Yeah. And then you end up having to be, I don't know, exercise, cleanse, you know, like whatever. And then you find that that all started because your kid or, you know, somebody you knew was messed around with something in your house completely unbeknownst to you. Yep, exactly. Hey, yeah, yeah, grandma, grandma got it, huh? Do I, do I see a crystal? I, I'm using yeah. it as a, like a, not a bookend. Hmm. What do you call it? Like a um, paperweight? Paperweight. Thank you. Use it as a paperweight. Yeah, sure you are. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you could use a lot of things for paperweight. Well, this was the thing that was close to me. Uh huh. No, no, it's great. I love seeing a crystal by you. It <laughs> fills me with joy. Okay, do you want to do another one? Yeah, let's do another one. Okay, let's go. I've had a few creepy, spooky things happen over my lifetime, but the story I'm about to share with you stands out as my first what the fuck moment. I was 11 years old, living on the edge of a small town in New Jersey. We lived in a tiny 500 square foot apartment a man had built himself out of a section of his home that rested on the edge of the woods. We lived at the end of a dirt driveway and we were surrounded by woods on three sides. It was actually very nice and not creepy at all. My older brother Rob was 14 and the two of us had always been explorers. 
My lifelong single father had always been keen on getting his two sons that behaved like two meth-soaked squirrels out of the (laughs) house. To one side of the property was a small tract of woods and within it was a hill. A hill that two kids couldn't resist climbing to find out what was on top. At the top of the hill laid an unfenced, well-maintained graveyard. We were spooked when we first found it, but we were not scared. Days, weeks, months passed as we began to find as I began to find myself seeking solace in this place. Living on the edge of town and being disconnected from my peers that all seemed to live in planned communities, I was left to find something to do. I'd walk the graveyards as the sun set over a cornfield that sat to the west of it. I felt at one with the earth and took note that I was walking among people's final resting place, people who had lived and died before me, people with dreams and families and lives. I was 11, but I understood this was existence. I was not a goth kid or depressed. I was just a boy with nowhere to go and nothing to do. Sometimes I'd pick flowers or memorials that had been toppled over by the wind. I'd mostly just hang out and think, though. If I ever saw a family or visitor, I'd slip away into the woods quietly and go home. I suppose it might have been terrifying for them to see a black-haired child with pale skin slipping away into the woods silently, but regardless, I never had any negative experiences being there. Jump forward about a year. Me, Rob, and a kid, Adam, that I went to school with, he lived on the opposite side of the cemetery, were walking the graveyard and came across an open grave. Being young, ignorant, and overall fuckwits... (laughs) We jumped down into it and then hopped out immediately. In, out, in, out, in, out, in, out. We did this for like 10 minutes, daring each other to stay in there longer. It didn't immediately dawn on me that this was to be someone else's final resting place. But when it did finally occur to us, we decided to leave. No big scares or chills. About a week later, I came home from the sixth grade and got started on my daily chores right away. By the time I got around to hand washing the dishes, my brother had already gone to his room to chill out. Now remember, it's just the two of us in this tiny apartment. No back door, no access to the place except for a front door where I can see and hear everything from where I'm standing in the, at the sink in the kitchen. I'm full into washing dishes when a shadow of a head appears to my right on the wall behind the sink. I immediately thought it was my brother standing behind me trying to be sneaky and scare me. Without turning around, I asked him, what do you want? Slightly annoyed. The shadow head moved just slightly, but I didn't get a reply. Even more annoyed, I asked again, louder, but nothing. I was not in any mood for my brother's shit. I spun around expecting to see him standing there with that stupid smile on his face, but he was not there, and I was dumbfounded. What? How? Hmm. I looked at his bedroom door, and it was closed. And then, at that very second, I saw it, and I'll never forget it. Just to the left of the closed bedroom door, standing 10 feet in front of me, was the dark, misty figure of a man. There weren't any facial features, no clothing, not even a full body. Just the dark form of an upper torso and a head. I was wide-eyed and confused. What the fuck? It stood there for a few seconds, and then it was gone. I told myself I didn't see what I thought I just saw, that Rob had been standing behind me and that was that. I bursted into his room asking, what did you want? He was sitting on the floor with his back up against the footboard of his bed. He had his headphones on and his music cranked up. What? Huh? When? Just now in the kitchen, you were behind me? I asked frantically. He just looked at me. I stared back at him, expecting him to give in and admit that he had tried to scare me. A look of concern washed over his face. Dude, what's going on? Are you okay? No, I am not okay. The CSI team in my head kicked into high gear. I saw the shadow on the sink wall. I saw it. It had to have been Rob. But then how did he get back into his room so quickly and quietly? Side note, my brother was born with an underdeveloped left leg that's three or four inches shorter than his right leg. So when he walks, it is a noisy thud, thud, thud. And also, he isn't very speedy. So again, how? Just how? Okay, I got it. It was my own shadow on the wall. Yeah, that's it. But what about the shadow man? Not now. Prove to yourself the sink shadow was you, Brian, I tell myself. I walk back into the kitchen and stood exactly where I was. I looked at the sink wall. No shadow. I moved to the left. No shadow. To the right. No shadow. I tiptoed and repeated the process. No shadow. I started to panic. I asked my brother to stand behind me, and he did, and still no shadow on the sink wall. What the fuck? 
No matter what I do, no shadows. I even got on a step stool. A person cannot cast a shadow on that wall, apparently. The way the overhead light was placed in the kitchen, it doesn't make it possible. We experimented in the kitchen for five minutes or more and nope, 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 nope. I accepted that I saw a shadow figure while I was doing the dishes when I spun around. What exactly was it though? And why was it there? We had never had anything happen to us before. Why now? And then boom, it hit us. The grave, the grave that lie just 200 yards from our home, the grave we disrespected. My brother believed me. I was never a kid that made up stories or lived in fantasy worlds. If I said I saw something, then I saw it. I can't remember whether we told my dad or not, but that night was difficult. And every night for the next couple of weeks would be just as hard. The night I saw the shadow man was just like any other. I went to bed, trying to push the whole thing out of my mind. Yet as I laid in the dark, I could feel a heaviness in my room. I rolled over on my side facing the wall, and it felt like someone was standing right behind me. You know that feeling you get when someone stands behind you but doesn't announce themselves? Well, I felt that times 10. The feeling was oppressive, and it felt mad. Not evil, just mad. Having a short-tempered military father, I was all too familiar with angry silences. Hmm, maybe it was my dad. I gathered the courage to roll over and look. Nope, no one there. I rolled back over, and soon the heaviness filled the room again. The feeling of being watched was tangible. I clutched my eyes shut. Go away, go away, go away, go away. I sang to myself in my head. It's hard to explain, but it was so heavy. And then just as quickly as the heaviness had washed over my room, I felt it lift and I was suddenly okay. I fell asleep and it went on like this for weeks. Heaviness followed by nothing at all. I asked my brother if he had felt what I had been feeling and turns out he had. He said it felt like dad was standing in his room mad as hell. He said it didn't last all night either. He would feel the heaviness and then it would go away. We talked about what time we'd feel it and even made notes using our bedside alarm clocks as references. We figured out that it must have been going back and forth between our rooms because when it was lighter in my room, it was heavier in my brother's room and vice versa. It's that man. It's that man, bro. I said distraught. I know, my brother replied. And again, it went on for weeks. I would wake up every few hours filled with dread. The heaviness was there, standing behind me. I grew anxious, stressed. I would cry myself to sleep, afraid to even roll over and face it. My brother was going through the same ordeal in his own room. What were we going to do? And then, one morning, I woke up and realized I had slept great, peaceful even. Hearing me awake, my brother came into my room and asked me how I slept. He had a little twinkle in his eye. I told him, actually, really well. You're welcome, he said. <laughs> uh, for what? I asked, confused. He nodded towards the head of my bed, and hanging on the wall was a large paper cross. I put that there last night after you fell asleep. I put one above my bed, too. I think it'll help. It already has, I smiled. I was a bit perplexed because we are not a religious family, not in the least. The only time anyone went to church was, well, never. We didn't say grace. We didn't pray. My brother had to make paper crosses because there weren't any in our home. Now, what I think we need to do is apologize to him so he leaves us alone, so he knows we're sorry, my brother explained. I agreed because, man, oh man, was I sorry. We sat on my bed, and we held hands, and we spoke out loud. We called out to him and said we were sorry, that we shouldn't have done what we did, and that it was wrong of us, and that he could go now because he'd made his point. We'd never disturb him or anyone ever again. I think that'll do, said Rob. Yeah, I think it will, but I'm not taking that cross down, I replied. He smiled and said, me neither. I never walked that graveyard ever again, and a few months later we moved away. I think about that time and I tell myself that it was guilt that I had been feeling, but that doesn't explain the shadow man that I saw, nor does it explain my brother also feeling the heaviness off and on, back and forth every night. It doesn't explain how the first night I had a peaceful night's rest in weeks was when, unbeknownst to me, my brother had snuck in while I was sleeping and hung a paper cross above my bed. My theory is that the cross worked because whomever the shadow man was, he was a religious person and the cross appeased him. Don't be a Darren, stay out of graves, and even if you're not religious, it might be good to keep a cross or a pocket full of crystals with you at all times. Oh my heck, JK. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. That was, uh, I, I, uh, Bonus points for meth-soaked squirrel. Oh, yeah. That's good, right? Yeah, that was, that's wits. great. Uh, yeah, I, I do love the word fuckwits. <laughs> I'd never heard meth, uh, meth-soaked squirrel. And then that whole— It's such a—sorry. It's just such an accurate depiction of young boys. Yes, yes. 
And then uh, just that whole thing of like him and his brother Rob jumping in and out of that grave. Yeah. That is such a, I, I could picture me and my friends doing exactly that. Like if we went and found an open grave, yeah. I feel like like the sequence of events that played out for them mm-hmm. would be exactly the same for me and my friends when we were kids. Yeah, I think that's like a little boy thing too. Yep, it, it, yep, because it, it would start with like, what are you afraid? Yeah. Yeah, get in there. Yeah. You get in there. No, yeah, I'll, get, I'll get in okay, there. baby. Yep, yeah, and then one kid eventually gets in and then they're kind of like scared, obviously, and they hop back out. It's like, oh, you little baby, you could, uh-huh. I can stay in longer than you. And then, it, and then you just keep one-upping. It's like, yep. I'm, in, I'm impressed that people could jump into a grave and climb back out. Cause I'm like, it's pretty deep. Yeah. It must, I mean, it must not have been, but. Yeah, maybe it wasn't truly six feet or maybe it was like slanted enough for them to kind of like crawl out. But little boys are like monkeys though too. That's true. Where, yeah, if you're like, I don't know, I don't know how old they were. I'm guessing, I don't know, eight, nine, 10. Well, he said sixth grade. So. Oh, I missed that part. So I, a little bit older. So like, like uh, uh, 11, 12, 12. See, yeah, like 11, 12. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, I feel like prime climbing years. Yeah. Oh, that's when you were like really starting to get your strength. Mm-hmm. And, you, and your body weight is typically like so low uh-huh. and you're just so limber and everything and, and not afraid of falling because you don't weigh much. Right. And you're, and you're resili- we don't even know to be afraid, honestly. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that cracked me up. And then, oh, and then I just thought that was such a cute little scene towards the end of like him and his brother holding hands. I know. And saying that they're sorry. Like, oh my God, that's adorable. Yeah, it's so sweet. <laughs> yeah. Imagine like walking in and our kids. Mm-hmm. Like if Kyler, oh my God, that would be like one of the greatest sights I would ever witness if Kyler Monroe were actually like holding hands, being sweet and asking for the same thing. My friend, that is never going to happen. <laughs> I know. Monroe's is, not a hand not, holder to begin with. Uh-uh. That's but, not, yeah, she's the one who's not, like Kyler when he was younger was the cuddly, warm and fuzzy one. He mm-hmm. would have done that in a heartbeat for years. Yeah. Monroe, not her temperament. No, I mean, she would, be sn- she would be snuggly and warm, but only sometimes, only on her terms. Mm-hmm. And then specifically with Kyler, she would be, she yep. was, she wouldn't hug him for years. No, because he wanted it too bad. Uh huh. And she said his hands were clammy. <laughs> it was just like such a little sister thing to like, yeah, ew, your hands are gross and clammy. Don't and, touch me. And then it made him so self conscious. Uh huh. He's lucky he has a good self esteem. I know. He's going to be, she <laughs> kind of destroyed him for several years. I know. He's going to be bringing her up in therapy a lot when he's older. Yeah. If he's not already. Yeah, honestly. He's going to be like going back and being like, hey, Monroe, fuck you. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, fair. Uh, oh, kids. But yeah, another another good one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm liking today's stories as far as uh, just creepy and interesting and yeah. Mm-hmm. I know. I love that they, um, both so far have had somewhat satisfying endings. Mm-hmm. You know, just tied up, nice little bow on top. Yep. All done. Yep. Okay, well, this is less satisfying. Okay. Okay, off to Cambodia. The story I'm about to tell you is about an urban legend widely known in the Southeast Asian regions such as Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Laos. This urban legend has been made into movies and told by elders. There are different versions and legends about these creatures throughout Southeast Asia. I'm Cambodian, so I'm going to tell this the way I know it. We call these creatures ops. If you had to compare an op to a creature that has been in the show, it would be similar to a Wendigo or Skinwalker. Hmm. The thing that they have in common is that they were once humans who commit a taboo or sinister act, turning them into foul creatures. Ops, most of the time, are depicted as women. During the night, their heads are released from their bodies along with their organs, heart, liver, stomach, and intestines. They hunt at night as a floating head with their organs hanging down and an orb of light at the end of their intestines. Once a human becomes an op, they lose all of their humanity. They become disgusting creatures feeding on rotting animal carcasses, blood, and feces. When a woman is about to give birth, it is common to put up spicks around the house or plants that have thorns. This is to prevent the op from stealing the fetus from the mother's womb and or eating the placenta. Then the newly born baby and the mother are to be kept inside the house, protected until dawn, while the husband and family bury the placenta very, very deep in the yard. If it is not buried deep enough, the op could use her super long tongue to dig the placenta out. Since the op does not have any limbs to use while hunting, they rely on their tongues, which are longer and stronger than human tongues. I know, so (laughs) gross. Nowadays, we don't see op as much anymore, but there were a lot of stories about op sightings during the Cambodian wrote... Cambodian Rouge War. Come here, Rouge, yeah. No, she wrote Cambodian Rouge War. Hmm. Now, here's one story out of many about an op sighting. This is my grandmother's story as she told it to me. My grandmother was walking with her mother from the temple at night with only a lantern to guide their way when they both heard a cry. Help me, help me. 
The cry was coming from a brush of bamboo. What they saw wasn't a full person, just a head. The head belonged to an old woman who lived in their village. Her stomach had been punctured by the bamboo trees, her organs on display. Her stomach was leaking blood and other fluids. Blood was covering her face. Who knows if it was her blood or the blood of a creature she had just hunted. There was no helping her. Disturbed, but not wanting to be victims of the op, my grandmother and her mother continued their walk home. On their way home, a man ran by holding a round tray, and on it was the dead woman's baby son. The next day, the woman's death was announced to the village. Her son told the people of the village that his mother had died from an infection, even though my grandmother and her mother knew better. That night, my grandmother and her mother weren't at all surprised to see the woman show up as an op. She had been known for practicing black magic in the village, getting paid to place curses on people and manipulating the emotions of others through spells of love or hate. She cheated her way through life and got paid to help others cheat their way through life as well. She had cursed herself into becoming a wretched creature by being a wretched human. Karma, I suppose. Now this part is for Lindsay in case she wants to go to Southern East Asian countries to kill, protect your, to kill and or to protect yourself from an op, carry a sharp object. This can also protect you from other humans if you need it. Ops are scared of sharp objects because it can puncture their organs and you can throw salt or something spicy at them and it will burn their organs. My grandmother recommends fish sauce. <laughs> However, you should be okay during the day. The op usually return to their bodies before the sun comes up. Once they return to their bodies, they look just like regular humans. But who knows? Maybe there are op living amongst us right now. Man, so many monsters. I actually made a note to um, order a book on folklore monsters from around the world or just mm -hmm. like to, to familiarize and just like learn more about like other countries' monsters. Yeah. But I mean, I, I, the, the op reminds me of, and I wish I could remember the name, but we did a story out of like, uh, it's somewhere in, in, in Asia or the South Pacific. I don't know if it was like the Philippines or Korea, but it was this creature. And I just remember like the pictures of like a head mm -hmm. with like its uh, entrails hanging out behind it. Yes. Uh, and it was female as I well. Th I think it begins with like a W. Uh, in the email where they sent the story, they had talked about some other things and like, yeah. oh, you know, it's kind of like this. It's kind of yeah. like that. So it's like their version. I just cannot think of what it is. I'm sure people listening right now are shouting. I know. Yeah, it's exactly. It's the blah, blah, blah. Yep, yep. Yeah, and, I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to bite your head off. It just I I know what you meant. Like Camille yeah, Rouge. Rouge genocide, that's yeah. not what they wrote. And I was totally. just trying to stay in the story. Sorry about that. No, no, no. Yeah, I, I just know you paused. And I, I didn't know if I. Yeah, <laughs> I paused yep. because in my mind I had to say Camille Rouge to get uh -huh. to Cambodian Rouge because it's written rogue. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Cambodian rogue war is not what I wanted to say. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then oh man, I forgot what I was gonna say. There was oh, I'm a, sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um, because there was that monster. Oh, I don't know. Entrails. People are going to be... Oh, the uh, the thing about like a morality, that there's a lot of uh, different cultures throughout history where it's like, uh, like with a skinwalker, uh -huh. where it's based on you've committed, you've, you've uh, oh, uh -huh. these moral transgressions and as punishment for committing these moral transgressions, you get turned into this like beast, this monster thing. Yes. And that's, uh, I found it interesting in this story Sorry. that uh, that comes from like, you know, with obviously like the, the Wendigo and the Skinwalker and like North American folklore, mm -hmm. but these cultures over in Asia who were not connected in any way mm -hmm. have a very similar beast. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It seems yeah. like every culture has its versions of X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Just a lot of commonalities around the world from all these like peoples who like were not in communication with each other. It does make sense though. I mean, at the end of the day. We're all just... Yeah, we worry um, about the same things, yeah. have the same fears. And I guess, you know, like in the days before as much science or any science, we, um, you know, created the same mythologies or saw the same monsters. Yeah. However exactly. you want to look at it. Yeah. I yeah. like it. Good stories. Thanks, bro. Yeah. Do you want to uh, start with the uh, Annabelles while sure. I get my glasses back on? Sure. Are you blind old bat? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank the following Annabelles for your endless continual support on Patreon. Couldn't do it without you guys. Abby Williams, Alex Cabello, Angelica Jimenez, Ashley Hargon, Kelly Plumhoff, Sammy Langbean, Brittany Boswell, Anna Banana, Tiffany Ditterline, and Paulette Aguilera. Tiffany Ditterline. Ditterline. Oh, I thought you said Ditterline. Like, Tiffany Diddles. Miss Diddles. Oh, I'm sure she's heard that. <laughs> Ditters. <laughs> Tiffany Ditters. Did you ditter? Uh, it would no. be better if it was Diddle. Oh. If her oh. last name was like, it sounded a lot like I'm Diddle. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure junior high, like it got transferred. I'm sure it was out. a hoot. 
<laughs> T- Tiffany Tiffany Diddles and Dan Cummins are you kidding oh, me oh boy what a pair you two would have been <laughs> I would like to thank the following Annabelle's Katarina Mofo uh, Aaron Budin excuse me Travis uh, Blumen or Blomendahl yeah Blomendahl I believe uh, Alicia Mendez Maureen Nino or Nino Selena Ragonesi Ragonesi Nicole Lindstrom David Schott Rebecca Armbruster and Annie Siff Arm Bruster. Brewster? Or Brewster. B-R-U-S-T-E-R. Arm Brewster. And you best be a professional wrestler with that. <laughs> yeah. Or at least be really good at arm wrestling. Arm Brewster. I like yeah. it. <laughs> it does sound like, sounds feisty. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I hope they are. <laughs> and I got some spoopy shout outs. Yeah, I do. I do have a few. Okay, I'm going to try so hard not to butcher this name. To M.M. Mbossi. From Alicia. Happy effing birthday. Thank you for being a loving partner. I hope you have the best day ever. Love you, boo. To Randall from Clark. I love you so much. To Bethany from Rhonda. Hang in there, babe. I love you. And to Jeanette from Tony. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. And that is our show. We hope you're having a great summer. Uh, thanks for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scared to death uh, You can email us. Uh, for everything else, info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thank you to Logan Keith, editing, publishing, scoring today's show. Thanks to Heather Rylander, organizing the My Story emails. To book editor Drew Atana, polishing and preparing listener stories now for book number six as we get ready to sell book number five. Woohoo! Don't forget. Don't forget. Uh, thanks to Molly Box for finding the first story I told this week and Sophie Evans for finding the second. We're on Facebook and Instagram where we post pics that accompany episodes and more at Scared to Death Podcast. We also have a private Facebook group called Creeps and Peepers, full of horror lovers. So get in there. Get in there. And a big thanks to the all seen eyes, the Creeps and Peepers moderators who continue to be the best. Enjoy your nightmares, Creeps and Peepers. Hope you are scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but have no home here within scared to death. Bad Magic Productions. Bonus points for meth-soaked squirrel. Oh, yeah, that's good, right?